process on uh, page 200, uh, 255 on the note, right? 255. Uh, isn't that right? No. How come the page is different? Hmm. I think we're going to discuss the chapter 11, chemical vapor deposition. And uh, here uh, in application, triple diffused and double diffused has been introduced here. Triple diffused and double diffused. Triple, triple diffused means, uh, as shown uh, in this figure, we start out with a piece of thread, and then we pattern it for the end, the collector. So that is the first diffuse. And then we make a P minus for the base, the second diffusion. And then uh, finally, we have N plus emitter diffusion. So that is a triple diffusion. But uh, in a double diffused uh, bipolar transistor, we start out with a P substrate, but we are doing the uh, buried layer implantation N plus. And then on top of it, we just grow the uh, epitaxial layer for the N minus. And uh, up to here, we do not. Uh, carry out the diffusion process, okay? We just to do the epitaxial growth on top of the N plus, and then we are going to have N minus out diffusion of the N plus from the buried layer. And then we uh, make a first diffusion for the base P here, and then emitter N plus as a second diffusion. So actually, in this double diffusion, diffused uh, bipolar transistor, we make we carry out only two diffusion process, which is the base and the collect uh, emitter. But in a triple diffused uh, bipolar case, we make uh, n minus collector, p minus base, and n plus emitter separately three times the uh, triple diffusion are necessary, is necessary. So uh, double diffusion epitaxial layer structure is uh, uh, what happened in the industry these days, okay? So for this, to grow the epitaxial layer, uh, we have to do the CVD process, okay? And uh, another application that we have discussed about these uh, CVD layers is this uh, locus process. You have to do the uh, oxidation. That oxidation maybe you don't have to carry out the uh, CVD. You may uh, done that with the thermal oxide, of course. The thickness is just a 300 angstrom around there. And, but you have to uh, deposit the silicon nitride by CVD, okay? And then you carry out the locus process and we have a smooth uh, surfaces at the, uh, for the active region there, okay? And then uh, for the gate, in a, uh, MOS transistor, we have to have a, a CVD silicon, okay? And that is a polysilicon, because that uh, silicon is deposited on top of the gate oxide, which is amorphous, okay? So we uh, should do the polysilicon deposition. It should be, Crystallize the silicon anyway. We cannot 
score with the amorphous silicon because if it is amorphous silicon, there is no way to do the heavy doping. This uh, gate has to have a low resistance so that it should be heavily doped. But if it is not a crystal structure, it doesn't have a crystal structure, then there's no way to make that low resistance, right? So uh, we have to do the CVD to make a polysilicon thin film for the gate. Well, this is a uh, passivation layer or interlayer dielectrics we call. And that is also been done by CVD for the silicon oxide layers. Okay. So there is many applications for the CVDs mm. and the VLSI process. Now there is a CVD system and atmospheric pressure CVD. That is a uh, uh, long time ago. We have done this a long time ago. Uh, we are not uh, using this AP CVD these days in a modern uh, VLSI processes. But uh, this uh, atmospheric pressure CVD has used the uh, uh, atmospheric pressure, 760 torr, okay? And you have uh, etching gas, HCl, to clean up the silicon surface. And then uh, you have a, a brain gas to, for the doping of the substrate, phosphorus. And the argon is the uh, carry carrying gas, okay? And then H2 is uh, 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 hydrogen gas to uh, facilitate the reactions. And then you can use the liquid, uh, 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 the silicon source, like a uh, silicon tetrachloride, that is a liquid, and then you, you bubble it, and then uh, you can use the source for the silicon deposition in the CVD. That is a typical example of the atmospheric uh, pressure CVD, AP CVD. But these days, this AP CVD is not used. Uh, and the reason is going to be discussed in shortly, okay? There are many types of the AP CVD. These days, this AP CVD is the most common uh, equipment for the VLSI. Okay, mm. you can notice that in the LPCVD we maintain the pre pressure inside the furnace uh, around the one tor. The atm atmospheric pressure is the 760 tor. Okay, so one tor is just 1,000 times uh, less than uh, the atmospheric uh, pressure. It's not high vacuum in any sense. It's just a uh, low, it, it's just a uh, not good vacuum, I mean, okay? But uh, this helps a lot. Uh, see, the diffusion coefficient is uh, inversely proportional to the pressure. So if you decrease the 1,000 times the pressure, you might increase diffusion of the re reactant gases uh, in the gas environment uh, pretty much you may enhance the uh, diffusion of the reactant gas in the gas pretty much, okay? So if you do, if you reduce the inside the chamber, you can load uh, many wafers in the atmospheric uh, pressure CVD, the wafers are located in this fashion or in this fashion or in this fashion, it has a uh, octagon and then uh, at each side, the wafers are loaded. But in the LP CVD, you can load the sample vertically like this. Uh, we call this the boat, okay, and then you can put almost 100 wafers at a time. 
in the uh, PCVD. And we're going to discuss about the reason why we can load many, uh, much more wafers than the APCVD in the LPCVD is going to be discussed uh, in a minute. Now, uniformity improves. Uniformity means the front, it is uh, all, along the uh, wafer by wafer uniformity, it includes the wafer by wafer uniformity and the inside the wafer, one wafer along the uh, along the surface of the wafer, the uniformity is also can be improved with the LPCVD. And uh, gas consumption much lower uh, because we do not have to use the carrier gas in this LPCVD system. Pressure is lower than the other environment so that the uh, reactive gases can be carried in the furnace without helping from the carrier gas. So, uh, amazingly, if you connect your furnace to the vacuum pump, then you can, uh, you don't need that much source of gases. You can save a lot of gases. That's something uh, uh, you cannot imagine, right? So the important thing is uh, uniformity and we can uh, have a, a high throughput and the uh, gas consumption is much lower in the air passivity. Because of these advantages, we are using the air passivity in uh, practice in most of the industries. Okay. Uh, let's just review a little bit about the single crystal architecture growth. And if you look into this uh, in detail, it is just an illustration of what's going to happen inside the CVD furnace. Okay. Well, the number one is a transport, and number two is also a transport, but it's by diffusion. Okay. Number one is the forced convection. You, have, you use a carrier gas or you have to use a low pressure. So that uh, the number one is a transport but is by forced convection. But in the number two, by the way, the uh, layer here, from here to here, is a stagnant layer. And that is going to be discussed later. But we have a certain uh, thickness of our layers where we are going to call stagnant layer, okay? In that the stagnant layer, the reaction happens in this fashion for the CVD deposition. And the number two is the diffusion of the reactant gases in the stagnant layer, the boundary layer, whatever, okay? And number three is the adoption. And number four is the surface reaction of the reactive gases. And number five is the deposition by product, okay, after the surface reaction. And number six and seven is just the uh, 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 opposite direction of what's happening in the number one and number two, okay. So this is the surface reaction, and then we call this a kink site, right? You can have a three diff different kink site, and on that kink site, you're going to grow the layers, one kink site, one row and row, row by, by this. Uh, you can um, grow the film from the substrate, and uh, it, it can be said this uh, A, B, C, D, E, but it's uh, uh, pretty much obvious and intuitive things, okay? And if you analyze this, just like a D and groove model, in the CVD, we have only two fluxes here. One in the gas phase, from the gas to the surface, and F2 is related to the surface reaction, okay? 
we have only two fluxes in the CVD process. And the uh, flux in the gas is related to the gas phase mass transfer coefficient, which is number one. And F2 is a surface reaction. And just like the oxidation reaction in the and groove model, we just use the chemical surface reaction rate constant. So the equation uh, it looks quite simple. Okay, a steady state F1 should be equal to F2, just like the uh, oxidation Dillian Grove model, so that uh, this equation can be equated like that, and then we have NS values in this uh, uh, equation, number four, and growth rate is going to be the flux divided by the number of silicon atoms incorporated per unit volume in the film, which is 5 times 10 to 22 per cube. All right, so simple. Now, the velocity growth rate in a CVD process can be expressed in the uh, equation number 6 there. Hmm. It's nothing uh, much, uh, special in there. But uh, the interesting part of this is that if you look into this carefully, you can see uh, the velocity growth rate is 1 over 1 over Ks plus 1 over Hg. Why is the flickering? Is that because of this? Okay. Okay, that is uh, this, and then NG over N. Okay, that is in number six. Okay. And uh, if you say why more fraction of the silicon species in the gas phase, Okay, then you can express this uh, like uh, number eight uh, here, n t over n. This thing is going to be replaced with the n t over n, and then y. Okay, and uh, with this equation, you can see immediately that. The velocity growth rate is proportional to y, the concentration of the silicon species in the gas phase. We're going to talk about the meaning of this in a, uh, in a minute. Okay, uh, the growth rate is determined by the smaller Ks or Hg. See, if you have a smaller value of this, and this, uh, the small, smaller one is going to dominate the uh, denominator and uh, and uh, and the front of the, the growth rate equation, so that uh, you can simplify. For example, if K S is a small, then the whole thing becomes the uh, the this is, is going to be K S. Okay, if K S is smaller than H uh, G, then this whole thing is going to be Ks, okay? And if uh, Ks is, Hg is greater than, uh, smaller than the Ks, then the, this whole thing is going to uh, Hg, okay? So that means that the growth rate now is going to be Ks and T over N and Y, something like this. If Ks is smaller than Hg. What does this mean? It means that if you have a small value of Ks, then the mass transfer coefficient means the surface reaction is not uh, is not active. Okay, that is a rate limiting step. In other words then the whole growth rate, the velocity, 
is going to be proportional to the kth values, the small ones, not the big ones, right? And vice versa. If hg is smaller than ks, now the whole equation is going to be governed by the hg instead of ks. The smaller one is going to control the whole process, which means rate limiting step is for the small coefficient. Okay? Now, it turns out that the KS is a thermally activated process. It can be presented by the Arrhenius type plot, as we have seen many times, many times like that, okay? That is actually the Boltzmann equation. But the HG is constant. It's not a function of temperature. What does that mean? It means that if you plot the coefficients, Okay, let's say this is Ks or the Hg, and this is one over T, then the Ks is going to be represented like this, but Hg is the constant. It's not a function of, not a function of the temperature. Okay, this is the low temperature, this is a high temperature because of the uh, reciprocal of temperature. Now, at this critical edge, we can uh, see that at the low temperature, the smaller ones is going to dominate the whole process so that the Ks is the smaller one. So this is a surface reaction control. Surface reaction control at low temperature, okay, and at the high temperature, you can see that the Hg is smaller than the Ks, so that the mass transfer, mass transfer or diffusion, will control. Diffusion will control the whole process. Diffusion will control the whole process. So that is a very important part of the CVD. It very much is, is very sensitive to the substrate temperature, the operation uh, temperature of the furnace. Now, if you run the CVD at low temperature, then you're going to have a reaction controlled by the surface reaction. But if you elevate the temperature, then the, suddenly it is going to change. The reaction is going to be governed by the different process of the reactive species in the gas phase, okay? Then you are going to end up with a, a very striking difference uh, and the films, like uh, uh, you know, at the uh, at the uh, uh, last time we talked about the step coverage, right? Step coverage. For instance, in the step coverage, you want to operate in this low temperature region. If you have a surface like this. And the surface reaction really controls the whole process. Then the, uh, the decomposition or CVD action is going to happen along the surface like this. So that we are going to have a good stack coverage if we decrease the temperature. All right? And uh, let's say uh, the grain size. can be small if you do the uh, CVD at the low temperature, okay? You don't have uh, enough diffusion of the species to get a, uh, large grains. This means you're going to have a smooth surface, 
right? Sumo the Safes. So it uh, may seem to you that you have to run the CVD at a low temperature instead of a high temperature. And, uh, uh, but the one of the drawback for the low temperature is that your reaction may not be completed. Uh, decomposition reaction may not be completed. For example, if you want to do the deposition of a silicon, you use the silane gas, and then you have you use the elevate temperature like a 950 to 1100 degrees centigrade, so that uh, you are going to have silicon and an uh, H2 gas, okay? And this reaction, if you decrease the temperature, so you uh, operate at the, uh, too much low temperature, then what's going to happen is that this silane gas is going to be decomposed into many species like uh, 3SiH, 2SiH, and so forth. Okay? Then your silica may contain a lot of hydrogen in there. Okay? So, uh, the, one of the drawbacks at the low temperature process is that the, the dec decomposition process may not be completed, okay? That is one of the drawbacks. Uh, in a high temperature process, if you operate the CVD at the high temperature, the stack coverage is, is going to be ruined. And so you're not going to have that uh, good uh, stack coverage. And you are going to have uh, agglomeration in air, agglomeration, of the particles before you hit the ground, okay? So that you're going to have some uh, porous, this means you're going to have porous uh, films. And you're going to have uh, bad topologies because the grain size is, not, is going to be big you are going to have a rough surface, and so forth. So uh, the high temperature operation is not uh, good in any sense. But uh, one of the uh, nice thing about the high temperature CVD is that you are going to have a complete decomposition process before you just heat the surface, so that you're going to have a, a high purity material. You, you, you can eliminate any incorporation of hydrogen in, the, in your film, in your silicon film, something like that. So that's very interesting and important. And if you look into the uh, uh, figure here, that is, uh, we are going to talk about the uh, silane gas, SiH4, and dichlorosilane, SiH2Cl2, that is expensive one, but it's uh, used uh, in the industry mostly these days. It's, you can have a very good quality of uh, silicon with that. And then uh, uh, you're going to have a tetrachloride uh, silicon. You can have many sources. and. Uh, it just says about the Y value here, molar volume of the silicon contained in the gas. Okay, that is different from uh, a silane to dichlorosilane, things like that. And then you can see the deposition rate is uh, very much dependent on the value of Y. Okay? You have a different value of uh, deposition uh, reactions because it has a different value of Y, okay? Silicon amount in the gas. Now, this is the temperature axis, one over T. This is a low temperature, this is a high temperature. At low temperature, as you can see, you're gonna have a straight line in this arrhenius plot, okay? And then the slope is related to the activation energy, and the activation energy for all these uh, sources, the same, like 1.9 electron volts. Okay, 
and that 1.9 electron volts uh, is very close to the binding energy of a silicon. Okay, so this that position may relate to the binding of silicon atoms. We can uh, think the basic mechanism for the deposition of silicon. At high temperature, the mass transfer controls so that we do not have a straight line, first of all, and uh, that is not uh, that uh, uh, obvious. Okay? It, it, you can have any values. So, at high temperature, is, it, 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 you can see that the mass transfer is important, but at low temperature, surface reaction is important, and uh, accordingly, you're going to have a nice topology, the step coverages, uh, small grains, you know, uh, whatever, at the low temperature in this uh, CVD process. So, uh, selecting set the proper temperature for the CVD is very important and the margin is not that big. The temperature range is very, uh, you, you can operate the uh, uh, temperature margin like uh, one to two degrees only. So, in other words, you have to operate the uh, silicon deposition at 950 degrees centigrade, not 1,000 degrees centigrade, things like that, very sensitive to the temperature. Okay. Experimental data. The molecular weight, square, uh, the root of the molecular weight, inversely proportional to the square root of molecular weight, that is the y values, and this uh, activation energy is 1.9. Now let's talk about the architecture growth. Uh, we use the silane gas, uh, I'm sorry, the tetrachloride gas, and then you can, you can see we have two steps for that. One is, firstly, we're going to uh, SiCl2, we are going to form SiCl2 and the HCl at the same time. And then on the wafer surface, this uh, uh, silane gas, dichloro, dichloro uh, silane gas, is going to be decomposed into silicon and the tetrachloride silicon. Okay? And then uh, you see the HCl, formation of the HCl, and then you know this HCl is going to edge the silicon. So this is a reversible reactions. Okay. In uh, silane gas, for example, SiH4, it's just uh, irreversible. It goes just one direction. But in a uh, silicon uh, tetrachloride case, you're going to see that it's a reversible because it forms the silicon as well as the HCl, which is the adjunct for the silicon at the same time. Okay, then uh, uh, for the epitextual growth, we have to use this uh, reversible uh, reaction reactants. Here is the sum of the sources has been tabulated in this table. And you can see the silane gas is reversible. Uh, it has a, a moderate growth rate and uh, low temperature deposition, uh, tetrachloride, like this, in the, in the reversible. And trichlorosilane is also reversible. And dichlorosilane which is uh, most popular in the industry, it's also uh, reversible, it shows the reversible reactions. And uh, this uh, figure says it's a more fraction of uh, uh, tetrachloride, silicon tetrachloride, 
and it means that if you go this direction, you have a more more fraction of a uh, SiCl4, which means you have a more flow rate of the gas. Okay, you increase the gas reactant the gas, then the growth rate, of course, is increased at the beginning, but at some point at the maximum beyond that then you're going to form a too much HCl, which is an agent for the silicon already deposited. So that uh, this uh, governs the whole process so that the deposition rate actually goes down, okay? And um, for the epitaxial growth, you do not want to have a high deposition rate because if you maintain the speed very high, deposition rate high, then uh, you, uh, your atoms will find less time to adjust itself to the uh, substitutional site, which is essential for the epitaxial growth. So that uh, shaded uh, uh, region is for the polycrystal, and beyond that, before that, we are going to use the uh, y values small to have epitaxial growth, epitaxial layers. Now, in case of silane uh, gas, since it is irreversible reactions, we just have just monotonically increasing deposition rate with increasing the uh, Y values, okay, which is different from the SiCl4. SiCl4 it is a very strange curve, but uh, with respect to the value of Y flow rate, but in case of silane, you just have a straight line. It's a simple ir irreversible reactions, okay. And I want to look at this typical operating uh, sequence or carefully because uh, you have to have a feeling what kind of temperature and flow rate we are talking about in the CVDs. Okay, you, you do the purging to clean up the uh, uh, chamber before you do any CVDs, and you do the HCLH because your surface has to be clean for the epitaxial growth. Okay, so before doing anything, you just flow the HCl so that you clean up the silicon surface. The other, all uh, contaminants will be eliminated with the HCl. It's going to react with the HCl. And then H about 0.26 micron of a silicon. Now you do the purge. And uh, look at this. Do you, you do the purge in, uh, this is not a trivial question at all to flow the hydrogen in this high temperature, okay? You, you do not want to any leak of the hydrogen at this high temperature. If you have a leak, then it's going to explode somehow, okay? You form the water and things like that. Anyway, so you have to do this to remove the HCl, which has been used to the clean, uh, surface clean, and then you grow for eight hours and 20 minutes. Isn't that right? Eight hours and 20 minutes? Uh, uh, that's two minutes, two minutes. What is it? Something here. Eight minutes and 20 seconds? Eight minutes and 20 seconds? Uh, that's a pretty short for the epitaxial layer, but uh, anyway, this is this means eight minutes and twenty seconds, and the temperature is one thousand fifty degrees centigrade, and then you put the point oh five percent silane gas, point three ppb billion PH three. So just to look into the numbers there, you see how sensitive. It is to the gas flow rate and everything. And um, you're going to pedal the silicon layer with this for the eight minutes. 
and then you do purge for one minute and cool down. So before cool down, you have to uh, remove all the reactant gases prior to okay, cooling. And then do the cooling in the H2 ambient. This is also important. You cool the chamber, not in the air. Okay. And then uh, do the end purge before opening the chamber. So all these processes it looks complicated, and then it has to be uh, maintained to have a go films. It's not a trivial question, okay? Uh, now let's see. Wafer to wafer uniformity. We are going to uh, talk about the stagnant layers on the uh, susceptor, okay? This is the final topic of today's lecture. Now, if you have a gas flow, reacting the gas from here to here, uh, from left to the right, and then you're going to form a stagnant layer, okay? Stagnant layer means there's no velocity along the x-axis. That is the stagnant layer, definition of a stagnant layer. And then you can see the thickness of the stagnant layer is going to be different from place to place, place to place from uh, this x equal to zero, okay? And then it goes up and then it's saturated to some thickness, okay? And uh, so the velocity next to the susceptor must be zero and uh, you can see the, your form of the stagnant layer is going to look like this. Okay, and this stagnant layer says at the here you are going to have a high deposition rate compared to the inside of this wafer because of this stagnant layer. Okay, see what I mean? Okay, so uh, uh, the velocity growth rate is proportional to the y values. The y is a molar uh, silicon atoms uh, uh, percentages, I should say. And so the uh, growth rate and the position x along the susceptor, and here at the very knows that at the very end, left end of the gas flow, you are going to have a very high deposition rate because there's no stagnant layer at all. But as you uh, go deeper and deeper, the stagnant layer is going to increase so that the gas, reactant gas, is uh, less re reactant gas is going to be supplied because of the stagnant layer, okay, in the far right hand side. So the, the, this is a growth rate, and then you can see the uh, uh, monotonic decrease because of this uh, stagnant layer. How can you prevent it? Uh, let me see. That's a simple. All you have to do is just to tilt a little bit, okay? How little? Maybe it is not to have to be that big, but the five to 10 degrees may be enough. It doesn't say anything, uh, just a few degrees it says, okay? Few degrees. But that's enough to prevent this stagnant layer thing. And uh, so um, all you have to do is just tilting the wafer from the flowing gas. So you just uh, place your uh, wafer something like this, okay? And that is for the atmospheric uh, CVD case. Now, what happened to the LPCVD? 
you're going to load the wafers like this in a boat in the air PCVD, right? And then the air PCVD, it has a low pressure so that it does not have a stagnantal layer like APCVD. In APCVD, as you have seen, the stagnant layer is going to increase like this, right? But in the LPCVD, since the pressure is goes down, you do not have, you are going to decrease, very much decrease the stagnant layers in the LPCVD. And that is the reason why we can load the wafers in this vertical. Now, the reactant gas goes flow in here, then it should move all the way to the uh, in-between wafers, right? To have a uniform deposition. And that is possible if you decrease the uh, pressure inside the furnace so that you can decrease the stagnant layer thickness. And uh, that is the main advantage of LPCVD. Okay, uh, I'll see you in the next week.